Elon Musk is known for making what sounds like outlandish claims and then making those claims real, or at least taking them some distance. The visionary called Elon Musk is doing it again. This time he nabbed a contract from NASA for the new lunar vehicle and a mission to Jupiter. This contract has Bezos fuming because his company Blue Origin was left out of the loop. We took a closer look at SpaceX and its links with NASA and how its Blue Origin fits into all of this. We hope you enjoyed the video. But before we get into the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel with notifications on so you don't miss any of the new videos we post. NASA and SpaceX going to the moon. SpaceX secured a $2.89 billion NASA contract to build spacecraft that will land astronauts on the moon for the first time in five decades. The fixed price contract is a major vote of confidence for Elon Musk's space company as the space agency is placing a large amount of responsibility for its cornerstone human spaceflight program known as Artemis on SpaceX. The announcement is a blow to Blue Origin, the rocket company founded by Jeff Bezos. They had proposed working as a national team alongside corporate behemoths such as Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin to design and build a lunar lander, and to Alabama-based Dynetics, which had put its own bid. But ultimately, SpaceX won with its bid to use a spacecraft the company is already developing on its own in South Texas. That vehicle, called Starship, is also the linchpin of Musk's personal goal of landing the first humans on Mars. Test flights of early Starship prototypes have all ended in explosions thus far, but the company is rapidly building new test vehicles. The U.S. Government Accountability Office denied protests that were filed by Blue Origin and Dynetics on Friday. While the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, had until August 4th to make the decision on the protests, they announced their response already. In denying the protests, GAO first concluded that NASA did not violate procurement law or regulation when it decided to make only one award. According to the GAO response, NASA's announcement provided that the number of awards the agency would make was subject to the amount of funding available for the program. In addition, the announcement reserved the right to make multiple awards, a single award or no award at all. In reaching its award decision, NASA concluded that it only had sufficient funding for one contract award. GAO further concluded there was no requirement for NASA to engage in discussions, amend, or cancel the announcement as a result of the amount of funding available for the program. As a result, GAO denied the protest arguments that NASA acted improperly in making a single award to SpaceX. Finally, GAO agreed with the protesters that in one limited instance, NASA waived a requirement of the announcement for SpaceX. Despite this finding, the decision also concludes that the protesters could not establish any reasonable possibility of competitive prejudice arising from its limited discrepancy in the evaluation. The New Artemis Moon Base NASA and SpaceX are planning on working together to take humanity back to the moon, while Russia and China are also busy with the same idea. The NASA plan has two phases. Phase 1 is to land human beings on the moon, and phase 2 is to colonize the moon. The colonization of the moon has various advantages for us. Not only will it be a stepping stone from where to launch future Mars missions, but the moon is also rich in resources like iron, aluminum, and many more metals. The moon is also rich in helium-3, which is scarce on Earth. The plan for the return to the moon includes the United States, EU, Japan, and Canada working together to place a small lunar space station named Getaway in orbit around the moon. Future missions will be conducted to Getaway and from there to the surface of the moon. Travel to the moon will not be conducted with SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, but with NASA's more costly SLS rocket with the Orion spacecraft. The Orion will be used to return crew safely to Earth by parachuting into the ocean. SpaceX's role will be to ferry crews from getaway to the lunar surface and back again using the Starship HLS. The moon base will be called Artemis, named after the Greek lunar goddess. It will be built near the lunar south pole from where it can source water, which is important for life and for the production of rocket fuel for further cheaper spaceflights. The first phase of the mission aims to land humans on the moon in 2024 and to start inhabiting Artemis by 2028. The plan to send humans to the moon fits well within Elon Musk's aim to send humans to Mars and beyond. 
His plan has always included using the moon as a forward base from where to range deeper into space. Artemis Moon Base Astronauts in 2024 will take their first steps near the moon's south pole, the land of extreme light, extreme darkness, and frozen water that could fuel NASA's Artemis Lunar Base and the agency's leap into deep space. Scientists and engineers are helping NASA determine the precise location of Artemis Base Camp concept. Among the many things NASA must consider in choosing a specific location are two key features. The site must bask in near-continuous sunlight to power the base and moderate extreme temperature swings, and it must offer easy access to areas of complete darkness that hold water ice. While the South Pole region has many well-illuminated areas, some parts see more or less light than others. Scientists have found that at some higher elevations, such as on crater rims, astronauts would see longer periods of light but the bottoms of some deep craters are shrouded in near-constant darkness. Since sunlight at the South Pole strikes at such a low angle, it only brushes their rims. These distinctive lighting conditions have to do with the moon's tilt and with the topography of the South Pole region. Unlike Earth's 23.5 degree tilt, the moon is tilted only 1.5 degrees on its axis. As a result, neither of the moon's hemispheres tips noticeably towards or away from the sun throughout the year as it does on Earth a phenomenon that gives us sunnier and darker seasons here. This also means that the height of the sun in the sky at the lunar poles doesn't change much during the day. If a person were standing on a hilltop near the lunar south pole during daylight hours at any time of year, they would see the sun moving across the horizon, skimming the surface like a flashlight laying on a table. It's such a dramatic terrain down there, said W. Brent Gary, a geologist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Gary's working with engineers on a virtual reality tour of the moon's south pole to help immerse astronauts, scientists, and mission planners in the exotic environment of that region as they prepare for a human return to the moon. While base camp site will require lots of light, it's also important for astronauts to be able to take short trips into permanently dark craters. Scientists expect that these shadowed craters are home to reserves of frozen water that explorers could use for life support. One idea is to set up camp in an illuminated zone and traverse into these craters, which are exceptionally cold said NASA Goddard planetary scientist Daniel P. Moriarty, who's involved with NASA's South Pole Site Analysis and Planning Team. Temperatures in some of the coldest craters can dip to about negative 391 degrees Fahrenheit. Initial plans include landing a spacecraft on a relatively flat part of a well-lit crater rim or a ridge. You want to land in the flattest area possible since you don't want landing vehicle to tip over, Moriarty said. The landing area should be separated from other base camp features such as the habitat or solar panels by at least half a mile or one kilometer. It also ought to be situated at a different elevation to prevent descending spacecraft from spraying high-speed debris at equipment or areas of scientific interest. Some scientists have estimated that as a spacecraft thrusts its engines for a soft landing, it could potentially spray hundreds of pounds or kilograms of surface particles, water, and other gases across a couple of miles or several kilometers. You want to take advantage of the landforms such as hills that can act as barriers to minimize the impact of contamination, says Ruthel Lewis, a biomechanical and industrial engineer, architect, and a leader on NASA's South Pole Site Analysis and Planning Team. So we're looking at distances, elevations, and slopes in our planning. At the moon, it's critical to keep the area around the landing site and base camp as pristine as possible for scientists. For instance, among the many interesting features of the South Pole region is its location right between the Earth-facing side of the moon or the near side of the side we never see from Earth, known as the far side. These two hemispheres are geologically very different, with the far side more heavily cratered and its crust thicker on the near side. Scientists don't know why the two sides formed this way. The Artemis base camp has to be on the Earth-facing side to make it easier for engineers to use radio waves to communicate with astronauts working on the moon. But scientists expect that over billions of years of meteoric impacts to the moon's surface, rocks and dust from each hemisphere were kicked up and strewn about the other. It's possible that astronauts could collect samples of the far side from their base camp on the near side. With that, we are done for today. What do you think about SpaceX, NASA, and the Artemis project? Feel free to leave a comment. Thank you for watching. Until we see you again, take care.